Good morning. It is Thursday, December 14th, 2023. Making sure I get the year right, unlike yesterday. And we are talking today about Francis sending everybody signals that he believes his time is almost up. And or at least that he doesn't have that much time left. And again, I'm going to preface this by saying I am not celebrating the potential um, end of Francis's time on this in this mortal coil. I have repeatedly told people not to do not to celebrate such things. But instead, if you have that inclination, instead, turn that inclination into a desire to pray fervently for the salvation of his soul and all the rest of the things that we as Catholics are supposed to do, which is not to say. I know the counter argument is when we see evil defeated, the Bible even says we are permitted to cheer. That having been said, while a hundred percent true, it's still good to prepare for the repose for his soul while he still has time because our Lord commands us to pray for everybody, our enemies included. We're to pray for our neighbors, for our loved ones, and for our enemies. That means we're supposed to pray for everybody, and especially for somebody with as high a stature in the world and allegedly in the church as him. <clears throat> so Let's talk today a little bit about the, all the signs that he has given us that he doesn't have that much time left. So I'm going to first wish good morning to everybody in the chat. The um, people checking in from all manners of the world, Desert Hills, Arizona, Windsor, Ontario, Jerez, Spain, Alaska, South Dakota. Um, I saw somebody, a, a channel member from Ireland in the chat. So good morning to everybody as we begin to talk about this. So Francis gave his 37th general audience recently. And so I want to frame everything he says here with some of his imparted words of, I guess you could call it wisdom. He says, he says if we don't live in the spirit, whatever that means, we are ideologues and we don't have the gospel. I'm going to show you his address, the, the, the relevant section of his address here. From his address, we get this. Quote, Pope Francis concluded his zeal of catechesis on the theme, the passion for evangelization, the apostolic zeal of the believer. In the 30th and final catechesis, the Pope emphasized the importance of the liberating proclamation of the gospel beyond proselytism and remaining in the habitual. When administering baptism, the celebrant touches the ears and mouth of the person being baptized and says, May the Lord make you grow up. And as he opened the ears and mouth of the deaf and dumb with the cry of Fata, may he also open your ears and mouth that you may hear his words and profess faith for the salvation of men and for the praise of God. Jesus accomplished the healing of the deaf and mute in a predominantly pagan area, and in this way demonstrated that the call applies to all people. We as baptized people should also listen more and more to Jesus and proclaim him. If we open ourselves to the work of his spirit, we could witness the, to the world the good news of God's liberating presence with renewed apostolic zeal. The Pope thus concluded the cycle dedicated to apostolic zeal, in which through the word of God, the lives of some witnesses, and the recent magisterium, we were inspired to develop a passion for the proclamation of the gospel. This concerns every Christian, I repeat from the beginning. In fact, missionary zeal is not propaganda to gain approval, nor does it fill the head with ideas, but rather it ignites the spark of God's love in the heart. It's an odd phrase, isn't it? It does not fill the head with ideas. To paraphrase a fine phrase, the heart of those to whom we proclaim is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. Apostolic zeal does not depend on organization, but on zeal. It will not be measured by the approval we receive, but by the love we give. End quote. He goes on and tells us that those who, I guess, don't do precisely as he says, are essentially ideologues. It's a very strange statement to give us. But a lot of what he says is true there. I mean, that, that's usually how he likes to present things. He says things that are very Catholic, but with a few things hidden in that aren't precisely Catholic sounding at all. So I want you to remember that, all that in mind, because we're going to go here to the part most of you have heard probably first which is that Francis has told us, told the world that he wants to be buried in St. Mary Major. Now, some people say, wow, well, that's a big symbolic thing. Maybe. He says his reasoning is he has a great devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and that's where he wants to uh, uh, lie in state at, I guess you could say. But remember also this, that prior to the 17th century, it was not unusual for not for popes to not be buried in St. Peter's Basilica, partially because St. Peter's Basilica wasn't finished until like the 17th century, but he wants to be one of the first to be buried there outside of St. Peter's in five centuries. So we go to the Gloria TV, nice short piece on this, 
Francis wants to be buried in the Basilica of St. Mary Major and not in St. Peter's, he told the Mexican journalist Valentina Alizraki on yesterday, on two days ago, the 12th of December. He has simply met with his master ceremonies to further simplify the already minimalistic papal funeral rites. As an excuse, he cited the devotion to the icon of Salus Populi Romani, which is in the Basilica. But there's another obvious reason. Francis knows that he has brought the papacy into such disrepute that will, few, will attend his funeral. That's uh, Gloria TV's editorializing there. Holding in the Basilica of St. Mary Major, which is much smaller than St. Peter's, will somewhat hide the ugly reality. Francis confirms his journey to Belgium in 2024, but he says he would have to postpone again his imaginary travel to Argentina and one to Polynesia. They say imaginary because, let's be real, there's no chance he's going to go He's going to go to uh, Argentina. There just is, is no chance. Um, he repeats the myth of a very close relationship with Benedict XVI, but that turns out that what he admires most about Benedict is the abdication. Benedict was a great man, a humble man, who, when he saw his limits, had the courage to say enough is enough. Francis implies that he lacks a similar humility and courage because he confirms that he had never thought of resigning. All right, so let's focus here on the on the concept of minimalizing the actual papal rights. You can tell he's got not a lot of time, that he doesn't believe he has a lot of time, which he might be wrong about. I maintain that he's going to be there until 2025 or later, but because he's working on changing the actual rights for a papal funeral. We saw the first hint of this with the way they treated Benedict the 16th. Do you recall that by all reports, Benedict's funeral was not conducted in the way that we would expect a, Bene a papal funeral to be held. It didn't conform to his requests. He had a very muted ceremony well away from most of the pomp and circumstance that any of his predecessors would have received. The excuse being, of course, that he had resigned and so was an emeritus bishop when he went to before our Lord. But beyond that, it was a sign taken by most of us who uh, who would get accused of having a hermeneutic of suspicion. We took it as a sign of disrespect to Benedict. But it's also a precedent. And in the next few days, you're going to hear me talk about things where I'm starting invoking the concept of a precedent. A precedent is an act done that can be used later to justify other things, even if they aren't related. Um, one of these I'm going to give you here uh, we'll talk about here briefly is uh, the is what Cardinal Fernandez said recently about ashes and cremation and things practices Catholics have always been against until the 1990s when the door was cracked open just a little bit in the new version of the Catechism of the Catholic Church and now Fernandez has completely changed everything and he did it by aligning what the church's teaching is on this to secular norms he explicitly said to the rules of the civil authorities. That is a precedent that will be used for all kinds of other things. Use your imagination on that. I'll have a formal video on that for you probably Saturday. That the concept of precedent is important here because we saw how Benedict was treated. Remember, Benedict was he he liked to present himself in a much more traditional way. The, the crimson shoes that he would wear, a lot of the majesty that he would bring to the papacy. But the only things he didn't do was wear a papal tiara, which had been abolished as a practice by Paul VI, or uh, ride the, uh, I don't remember what it's called, the the uh, the litter that they carry the Pope, in, that you would see preconciliar popes carried in, where there would be several carriers who would pick him up and carry him literally above the heads of the other cardinals when they would meet in consistory. To my knowledge, he never uh, used one of those either. But other than those things, Benedict was very much in favor of a lot of the majesty and symbolism of the, of the papacy. And so when they did him dirty that way, so to speak, by taking away the traditional funeral that you would give a pope, that was a precedent for what we're seeing now. And Francis is going to further simplify this. And in so doing, what you're going to see is that a pope is, uh, is going to, in the future, be given, will be given funerals that are that have less pomp and circumstance than even that of a the president of a secular country. If you've ever watched the funeral of an American president, maybe when Ronald Reagan passed away or um, more recent uh, George H.W. Bush or any of these other figures, when it was their time, they were given pomp and circumstances about as much as you could expect in a country like the United States. You're going to see things to that level or lower with Francis and afterwards because the whole point of the church is to, to have the church step away from most of its supernatural claims of what we would call um, 
triumphalism. That's the term that they, they like to throw around a lot. This idea that the church has claims that the secular world should listen to about eternity. This is a, the overt rejection of the social reign of Christ the King. And if the if the self describe if the vicar of Christ is no longer the, even having that title, as Francis stepped away from it and put it as a footnote as a historical title, and instead is treat you know treats secular authority figures with the kind of with undue respect and having hosting them at the Vatican and letting their conferences be held there, you can also see this happening with the funeral rites of the Roman pontiff, which is why we're going to be going over this here. So the, but the big one, the very big one here is that papal conclave rule story is simply not going away. I'm going to bring this over to here, here now. You see they're, they're scrambling to cover the papal conclave rule changes. As one observer notes over at a blog called Corvin's Catholic Corner, which I'll put in my show notes today, um, they first quote Henry Sear. And yes, I'm pronouncing it correctly because I listened to his podcast episode where he discussed where he, the, the article that's going everywhere that I said I would discuss in more length today, but I'll actually probably do it tomorrow. He actually pronounced his name as Sear. I heard him say it himself, so take his word on it. Um, over at, at, at the um, at that Catholic blog, they point out something here that I'm just going to quote them verbatim on. But first, here's what Henry Sears said. He said, this was the disclosure of a plan to change the rules for the papal conclave so as to introduce the participation of lay people, including women. What they showed us was that the point of the preceding synod had not been the document to emerge from it, but the process itself. It was designed to soften up the church for a revolution in the papal election. Thus, we had bishops making declarations like it will be impossible from now on to hold a synod without lay participation. They're going to like they're like in the process already of speaking of conclaves like a synod because it's a, a synod is a gathering of the bishops. Well, what is a conclave? It's a gathering of the cardinals who are 99 percent of them are, are also bishops. Yes, it is possible to be a priest cardinal. There are a few of those running around whether they can actually vote in a conclave or not. I'm not exactly sure on, but there is there has been talk about this change happening. And when the Vatican denied it. They didn't put all that much energy into denying it. They said that it wasn't true. The person who was behind it, the Bishop Gerlandi, said it wasn't true. But then we got word that the Vatican was scrambling to find where the source of information in Rome was coming from, where that leak had happened. That's your big sign. So back to uh, what the what this writer says. He says, Seer makes no predictions except to say it will only get worse. I myself, for whatever it's worth, would say that that should this actually eventuate, the schism in the church will be finally formalized, meaning a good number of cardinals will not participate or conclave among themselves and elect a pope that one, that one, that way one against the mainstream church. Meaning that we're a lot of people will say when this happens, you're going to get overt schism. The focus here is, of course, on the chain, the rule proposed rule changes. Francis has been focusing on changing rules and procedures in the church at lightning pace. You saw that with the document he issued late in the summer, um, as well as on, there's a mode proprio on theology that he, that he issued that fundamentally changed things and called for a paradigm shift, as well as his issuing of the changes to the rules on how Vatican City is governed. This all happened in the, within weeks of each other this year. Who in the church would accept a Bergoglio Pope imposed without the smoke and mirrors, all the chaff and countermeasures veiled via a traditional election? This would be truly an in-your-face affront to Catholics, putting, putting, forcing us into a shut-up-and-take-it territory. Such a carefully chosen St. Gallen individual would be naturally very naive and pliable or easily controlled, and yet another modernist like Bergoglio, and probably callous and shallow in the extreme. It's one thing to argue Bergoglio was or was not validly chosen. It's another to change the process of a thousand years and simply install someone no one can trust to do anything but wreak more havoc. This rebellion against such a conclave would include more than traditional Catholics, but we trads are the tip of the halberd. As Henry Sears says, a corollary of this is Bergoglio's drive against tradition. Pope Francis realizes perfectly well that the only real obstacle to his revolution comes from traditionalists in the Catholic Church, the only element with any backbone prepared to recognize that the emperor has no clothes. Hence the campaign he has waged throughout the pontificate against so-called rigid and backward Catholics whom he derides at every opportunity. And so there you have it. The church's 11 purgatorial years of this buffoon blatantly imposing ecclesiastical perdition finally making sense. It was all a gambit to change the method the College of Cardinals chooses a holder of the papal office, a method to establish the ape of the church forever. If you're a listener to this channel, because I was probably the only one using that term beforehand, thank you for uh, posting this. It has been very helpful. 
One thing that would be true, at least the conservative Catholics and mainstream traditionalists won't be throwing words, set of a contism, set of a contest and schism schismatic around as barbs as those who have seen this fiasco from the get go have seen. Meaning what we're seeing here is the ramping up, the changing of the rules. That has been a characteristic of 2023 and will probably be a bigger characteristic of 2024. One of the other things we've seen happening is a flurry of bishops have been appointed, including like countless auxiliary bishops and others who are in the power pipeline for promotions in the future. I've seen a lot of those stories in passing lately. These are happening in dioceses in America, especially where one, yes, it's legitimate because they're desperately needed. There's a lot of bishops openings in North America right now. And now you're getting auxiliary bishops named in places where they need them, which means that they're now in the pipeline to become actual bishops. And who gets to approve those bishops? Rome. There's also a new bishop in formerly tradition-friendly Toulouse, France. After a long time of them having a big dispute with Rome, that's the coadjutor bishop that I spoke about earlier. There's a new bishop in Morocco. And again, tons and tons of auxiliary bishops, as well as there's news of other bishops coming in the pipeline. But of course, the other ramping up up is the numerous bishops removed. I've got a video going live. If you're not a channel member or a patron, you, you're not, a, you don't have, you didn't have early access to this video, but there is, I have a video going live in just under an hour from the time that I'm broadcasting this about another bishop who was removed. It happened just a, a few days ago. It became news just a few days ago. It happened outside the United States, which is why I'm not hearing about it until just yesterday, basically, when I put that video together. That happened. How many bishops have we seen removed in just the last few weeks? The numbers have been staggering. I, Like I said, I have an article that I'm putting together for Catholic Family News, and actually I've submitted the draft of it already. It'll be for their January issue, where there were 25 bishops over the last decade. But if you look at the numbers, in the last couple of years, they, a lot of those bishops have been within the last two years, and three or four of them this year. That in terms of the actual percentage of bishops removed. In 2023, the number is disproportional to the rest. That is all, those are all signs that Francis is ramping things up. Of course, we also have the issuing of new synodal documents, the Synod of Sin continuing in October. Are there any other signs that you folks think of Francis being made more aware of his limited remaining time? Harmony Gordon says 2023 is wild. Agreed. Agreed. Couldn't the next Pope just change the rules back? Yes. Assuming, but the whole point is to make sure that they don't get, that there isn't a Pope not to, to the cut from the Bergolian mold. April, April 8th, 2024, second eclipse of the Shrine of the Miraculous Metal. We'll see if it amounts, if that actually, if it means anything or not. I don't think that's a coincidence. I mean, that's a, it's an interesting thing where that where the where like the zero point of the of the eclipse will be over the shrine of the miraculous metal in North America. Robert Richards says the theology of Francis is garbage. I guess I was proselytizing to converting to Catholicism in 2020 and then forced into the SSPX three years later. Right. The uh a friend of mine many years ago who helped me become Catholic would, uh, I guess, be guilty of proselytizing according to that logic. Esther asks that, says that many believe that somebody better than Francis is coming, but what if it's actually worse? This is why the conclave rules are up for being uh, changed. It's because you have to have these rules that they, all the changes in the faith that we've seen in, in the last decade, to make them permanent, you have to have one or more successors who are cut from the similar kind of cloth who will not undo what he has done so that people accept them. Imagine, for instance, what would happen if you got a uh, the traditional kind of pope that many traditional Catholics openly say we want, who would, you know, undo the new mass, who would roll back conciliar changes, all those things. What would happen if he did all that stuff overnight? He didn't do it incrementally, but he did it overnight. It would not go well, to put it mildly. They know that, which is why they're trying to push all these things now and then have them in place for a long time so that people get accustomed to that. Because at the end of the day, while I truly believe they are true believers in what they're doing, they believe they are on a mission from our Lord to impose the changes that they're doing. They know that there's a risk that it'll all be undone. 
Anthony about from Avoiding Babylon. Check out his channel if you haven't heard it, uh, that aren't familiar. Thinks he'll be, he, that we'll have him for another year, basically, more. That's kind of my thinking. I expect he'll hang on to see the end of the Synod of Sin, and we'll get his final document, that they, they, that, that, will, that we'll get all that much. But we'll see. Again, I don't like making these kinds of predictions, which is why I'm going to reiterate, our Lord told us to pray for everybody, including our adversaries. So pray for him. Say a prayer for him. Every time you have a negative thought about him, say an Ave Maria, pray an Ave Maria for him. That will help to mitigate any, any justifiable things that could turn into sinful inclinations. Joel says, he will pass. We need to, re to we need to really take an eternal perspective on this and pray like never before. Even more so, make sure that our individual lives are in conformity with our prayers. Holy, yes. Don't let any kind of these negative ideas end up separating you from our Lord because it can happen. <sighs> anyway, thank you folks for turning in today. Please do check out that news video I have going live for you soon. It's it's a big one. It's a big one today. So thanks for tuning in. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.